Midsummer casts its radiant glow upon the land. As the sun falls below the horizon, the world is suspended in wonder, and flowers whisper the secrets of the moon. It is a time when ancient fairies, whose sacred names only witches may know, are set to frolic in meadows, and paint the night sky with their luminescent glow. My name is Radiana, and as the gateway opens wide, I will carry you across the threshold to that mythical time, when the divine entourage and their nocturnal goddess are set to impart occult knowledge to witches, recruit the souls of dead women among their ranks, bestow healing powers and enchanting scents to plants, and take away the speech and sanity of men. In Romanian folklore, Midsummer is celebrated on the 24th of June as the Day of Sons Iene, who are often referred to as fairies or nymphs in English, but that is an oversimplification, as we shall see. Like most peoples in the Northern Hemisphere who also observe Midsummer on the day of the summer solstice or around it, Romanians celebrate the peak of the season, the triumph of light over darkness, and reenact the cosmic event by lighting bonfires which are believed to invoke the sun's power. And similarly to traditions across Scandinavia, the Baltics and the Balkans, the Romanian Midsummer is celebrated with great enthusiasm, as people dress in their traditional attire, sing folk songs and dance in circles. Flowers and wreaths are believed to become magically potent and are thus used as adornments, decorations and instruments for healing and protection. Midsummer's Eve is also associated with mythical creatures and supernatural events. Folklore tells tales of witches and fairies roaming the earth on this night and various rituals are practiced to ward off evil spirits. For instance, the widespread tradition of lighting bonfires is believed to draw power from the sun to keep away witches and ward off the fairies. Although inherently pagan, the celebration of Midsummer was also influenced by Christianity in many countries, and people celebrate the feast of St. John the Baptist on the same day. And this interweaving of archaic, pagan and Christian influences is most fascinating in Romanian folklore, where the day of Sanziene holds a special place in the hearts of many as a symbol of their magical heritage. The day of Sanziene is a time of solar celebration when women of all ages dress in traditional attire or white garments, gather flowers and weave floral crowns, drawing upon the ancient magic of the mythical fairies. In villages, people gather at dusk and light bonfires, dance, sing and drink, and before they return to their homes, they light a wheel of hay on fire and hurtily down the hillside, mirroring the setting sun and ushering in the changing tides of the seasons. It is thus a time when the boundaries between the mundane and the mystical fade, and the mortal and mythical realms become one. It is said that as the two worlds collide, one may catch a glimpse of the Sunziene and experience their magic. Sunziene are said to be enchanting divine beings, nocturnal and lunar, feminine and mysterious, majestic and rebellious, who are part of the procession of a goddess referred to as Sunziana, or in some regions, Dragaika. On Midsummer's Eve, they are said to bless the crops, animals and barren women with fertile magic, and give alluring scents and healing powers to plants, especially to the one that bears their very name in Romanian folklore, Ladies Bedstraw or Yellow Bedstraw. If they are dishonored, especially by men glimpsing at them as they dance, fly or bathe on their feast, it is said that they will take away the man's speech and sanity. These female divinities, often compared with sylphids and fairies, which oversimplifies their nature, are a kind of mythical nymphs, referred to as Zune or Yele in Romanian folklore. It is said that they are also joined among the ranks by the spirits of women who leave their tombs on the night of Easter and refuse to return. To win their favor, they are bestowed with euphemistic epithets such as the sacred ones, the dancers of the air, the maidens of the field, the empresses of the sky, the beauties, the brides, the enchantresses, the blessed ones, Shoimanele or the lady hawks, the women of the wind, the Rusali at Pentecost by the same name of the holiday in Romanian, the Sanzian at Midsummer when the day is named after them once again, or referred to simply as Yele or them or those, by pronouns and demonstratives in the third feminine person that bestow upon them an air of mystery and reverence. It is said that they grace the mortal realm from Pentecost until Midsummer, 
bathed in the shapes of innocent maidens or wise elderly women, their ethereal forms donning luminous and veils. Their heads are adorned with crowns made of wildflowers, and some are said to wear bells around their feet and chains on their chests. They always appear unified in groups of odd numbers, from three to nine, soaring through the air or dancing and flying naked against the sky. Under the cloak of darkness, one might catch a glimpse of these mesmerizing apparitions, gracefully gliding and fluttering through the atmosphere. Or they might see them appearing near wells, amidst ancient trees, or at crossroads. It is said that they are accompanied by unseen flute players and drummers, whose ethereal melodies resonate through the night. Their celestial chorus echoes as they ring melodious bells, interweaving with the enchanting harmony of their own voices. They revel in timeless dances, performing the circle dance with graceful and mesmerizing motions, spinning round and round. They indulge in libations, engaging in joyous festivities, their euphoric laughter intertwining with the night breeze. United in their celestial chorus, they sing with resolute passion, their voices resonating as they intone. If God had allowed, the world would be all ours. The very ground upon which they have danced and celebrated bears the imprints of their captivating presence, the scorched grass serving as a testament to their magical powers. Should one be fortunate enough to witness or hear their otherworldly procession, one must remain still and observe their ethereal display in silence. These beings are not to be disrespected by unwanted guests or watchers, for when our world and theirs collide at magical times, they reserve their retribution for those who sow seeds of enmity, those who disregard their holy days, or those who wander at night in sacred places during their feasts at Pentecost and Midsummer, for then the night belongs to them and not to men. If one sees them so, it is said that they become struck and their soul is taken by them through a simple gaze. Even stepping in their scorched footsteps causes afflictions, be it rheumatism, paralysis, epilepsy, or the tumult of the mind. People whisper of those taken by Yele, or those away with the fairies, forever marked by their mystical influence. But there exists a cure. The mythical creatures hold a key to restoration concealed within their realm of enchantment in the other world, which would open again in the following year. If one were to return to the same spot where their soul was taken a year later, their spirit would be restored. But some cannot wait that long, and so they seek the help of the Kalushari, a brotherhood of exclusively male dancers known to be the only ones with the power to restore those taken by them during the days of Pentecost through their mesmerizing dance and favor of a solar horse god of Indo-European origins. It must be said that, albeit dangerous, these fairies are not inherently evil. Rather, the maladies they spread seem to be a consequence of unwitting encounters between what are believed to be divine beings and mortal beings, particularly men, at times when such encounters are not favorable, such as the Pentecost night or Midsummer night. In times like this, the magical and mortal realms become one, and so contamination and lingering influences can be felt by those who violate what is sacred, that is, the modesty, mystery, and magic of the Divine Feminine. There is a reason why the fairies guard the Divine Feminine so fiercely. In the time between Pentecost and Midsummer, they protect their processions from males and punish those who see them with loss of sanity, memory, and speech. They keep their magical mystery from them, but reveal it to women whom they favor. It is said that during this time, the fairies recruit the souls of dead women within their divine troops and visit witches to impart occult knowledge, revealing to them the secret names and healing powers of plants. And they do so as agents of their patron goddess and the queen of fairies and witches, which goes by several names in Romanian folklore. Yana Sanziana, Irodasa, which is Herodias, Aradia, Zanabatrina, which means old fairy, or Dragaica. The latter is a word of Slavic origin only used in southeastern Romania, and it is derived from the root drag, which means dear or beloved, and the midsummer traditions in the regions it is used are mostly connected to love and fertility. As for the other names, they have all evolved from the dark Roman goddess Diana and her fusion with the legendary Herodias who manipulated the execution of Saint John the Baptist. To the Romans and in Hellenistic religion, Diana, often represented accompanied by a stag, 
was the sister of the sun god Apollo and a virgin goddess of the hunt, wilderness, crossroads, childbirth, chastity, the underworld, and the moon, identified with the Greek Artemis and Hecate. According to Romanian historian of religion Smircea Eliade, the Sunziena have their roots in a cult dedicated to her worship. In Romanized Asia, Diana Sancta Potentissima, like the Greek Hecate and Artemis, was identified with Bendis, a goddess of the moon, night, forests, and magic, who was said to be often accompanied by dancing satyrs and menads. Scholars believe that she was worshipped primarily by women, and according to Herodotus, her cult was borrowed from the Dacians by the Thracians. Bendis was also revered as a goddess of marital unions, and the Proto-Indo-European root of her name, Benth, means bond or connection. As Romanized Dacia became influenced by Christianity and transitioned into the Romanian cultural context, the name Diana became synonymous with the word Zuna. The dark Roman goddess Sancta Diana evolved into Sunziana, and the Dianatic, the ecstatic followers of Diana, who were said to be possessed by her, evolved into the word Zanatic, which means crazy, foolish, or bewitched by the fairies. To me, it seems that much of the superstitions and lore around the Yel and Sisiana protecting their modesty and divinity from men and rendering them mute upon sight stems from the myth of Diana and Acteon. The myth, found in Ovid's Metamorphosis, tells the story of a young hunter named Acteon who stumbled upon the goddess while she was bathing with her nymphs, causing them to scream and cover her. In her anger and embarrassment, Diana splashed water on Acteon, transforming him into a stag, and robbing him of his ability to speak. Filled with fear, Acteon fled only to be chased and killed by his own hunting dogs, who no longer recognized him as their master. Like in this myth, the fairies in Romanian folklore are said to bathe in rivers on the nights between Pentecost and Midsummer, and whoever sees them or drinks from the water will lose their speech or sanity. And the water may likewise contain the soul of a deceased as when a fairy bathes, she transmutes the earthly waters into Saturday's water, which in Romanian folklore is both the primordial ocean and the river of the dead. And so it is believed that drinking from the water may cause one to become possessed by the dead, or even die. It is important to know that the evolution of Diana and her entourage occurred within the realm of folklore, particularly in rural settings associated with fields and forests, which preserve the religious and linguistic continuity of the syncretic cult of Diana, embedding aspects of it within Romanian mythology. In the Romanian myth of the creation of the world, the chastity and lunar aspect of Diana is personified in Iana Sunziana, the sister of the sun. It is said that, at the behest of the devil, who was his brother, God created the sun, and he gave the sun a chariot drawn by seven horses to carry him across the sky and under the earth, thus dividing the time between day and night. For seven years, the sun brightened the day as he rode his horse-drawn chariot across the sky, but the nights, when he rode under the earth, were very dark. And so the devil asked God to create the moon, which he did from the spark of a precious flint stone. He named her Yana Sunziana, gave her a chariot drawn by seven white horses, and told her to follow on the trail of her brother, ensuring that she would always be behind him. As she rode her chariot across the sky behind her brother, the people marveled at her beautiful face and silver brilliance. The sun, her brother, likewise marveled at her beauty and fell in love with her. Although she rejected him, the sun continued to pursue the moon and forced her to marry him. Seeing their unholy union, God swiftly threw the moon into the sea, and the sun immediately followed in his burning chariot to retrieve her. God then took the moon from the sea and threw her into the sky, transforming her into the celestial body we see in the night sky. Ever since, the sun is said to continue his pursuit of the moon, burning with an untamed fire and a love that lights up the world. It is said that when his yearning will tame his fire, the end of the world would come. The myth is retold in folk tales with slight variations, but in all, Sunziana refuses the union with the sun and gives him impossible labors to complete before they could be together, growing ever colder and distant. In some tales, she is protected by an enchanted stag and is depicted in communion with the forest and wildlife, evoking the imagery of the goddess Diana. And like the goddess, she always remains a maiden. While the chastity and lunar aspects of the Daco Roman Diana were personified in Yana Sunziana, the others have been reserved for a more demonized version of her, Irodeasa. 
sometimes referred to as Irodiada, Arada, Aradia, Znabatruna, or the Old Fairy. She is said to be the goddess of the fairies, the spirits of dead women who join their ranks, and witches whose processions take place near fountains, at crosswords, and in deep forests. When these processions are witnessed by men, they become ill, and it is Irodasa who holds the cure. And for this reason, the Kalushar pray to her before their dancing ceremonies, although they fear they may fall victim to her entourage of fairies, and so they chew on wormwood or artemisia leaves for protection. The Kalushari are a brotherhood of dancers who are believed to possess the ability to cure the maladies inflicted by the fairies during the days of the Pentecost through their choreographic and cathartic rituals. According to Eliade, they form a secret society of men or Mainerbund who honor the patron of the lunar fairies while simultaneously celebrating their bond with the solar horse god Kalush a symbol of the sun, masculinity, and heroism. Their annual gatherings at Pentecost hold deep spiritual and communal significance, allowing participants to connect with their ancestral roots and seek healing through music, dance, and trance-like states. Irodasa's invoked presence during these rituals suggests a transformative and liminal role. As the queen of the fairies, she bridges the gap between the human and spirit realms, facilitating the exchange of energies and the restoration of physical and spiritual well-being. Her association with healing and ecstasy highlights her ability to bring about both positive and potentially perilous outcomes, emphasizing the duality within her character. And this unity of opposites, or coincidencia oppositorum, is a recurring theme in the folklore surrounding the fairies and their goddess, and this becomes more apparent as we unravel the origins and evolution of this old fairy. The hypostasis of Diana in Romanian folklore as the old fairy or Irodasa, and especially in funeral songs, exhibits a complex behavior. She serves as a guide to the other world, showing both the right path and the wrong path to the soul of the deceased, and offering them fresh water or the water of forgetfulness to drink. She can wash away the deathly sweat from the deceased person's body or request parts from it as a toll. She guides women through the cycles of life and death, and keeps some of them in her divine entourage. And she often is, like Diana, accompanied by a stag who is a psychopomp in Romanian folklore. As the queen of the fairies, she commands the divine entities and sends them to witches who seek her favor in healing incantations. She displays dominion over nature and the elements, as she and her entourage are set to control the atmosphere during their feast and use their divine powers to enhance the magical potency of plants, the yield of the crops, and the mating of animals. She is likewise a queen of witches who enhances the powers of magical women on her feast and favors their healing, love, and divination rituals on Midsummer. And this is further depicted in an incantation that describes her ecstatic entourage as nine holy hawks, with nine shovels, with nine brooms, with dresses adorned in black, with golden sashes. They twirl their dresses with wicked eyes, and their sables dangle from their chests. From the sunset they arise, and at the sunrise they depart. This hypostasis of Diana in Romanian folklore is cognate with her hypostasis as Aradia in Italian folklore, which better highlights how this demonized manifestation of the goddess came to be. Around the 10th century, rumors began circulating about a coven of witches who worshipped both the goddess Diana and the biblical Herodias. By the 12th century, these rumors had spread from Italy to other parts of Europe, although these were dismissed by the Roman Catholic Church as either superstitious or diabolical delusions. Some scholars believe that the cult emerged during the Roman Empire's transition to Christianity, as pagan Roman women held onto their magical heritage personified in the goddess Diana until the early medieval period, and likewise incorporated the biblical Herodias into their belief system, naming her a daughter of Diana, although it is worth noting that others identified Diana's daughter as the Germanic goddess Holda instead of Herodias. Now, the biblical Herodias was a princess of the Herodian dynasty in Judea during the time of the Roman Empire. It is believed that Herodias was married to Herod II and later divorced him to marry his half-brother, Herod Antipas, who likewise divorced his wife to marry Herodias. This was publicly criticized by John the Baptist and so Herodias demanded his head, but her husband refused at first. According to the Gospels of Matthew and Mark, Herodias then arranged for her daughter from the first marriage, Salome, to dance for Antipas and request the Baptist's head as a reward, to which he eventually complied. 
Well, this makes for an interesting addition to the folklore of Midsummer, which is also celebrated as the Feast of St. John the Baptist. It is very likely that pre-existing hypostasis of Diana is Hera Diana or Herodiana, a conjunction between multiple goddesses such as Hera, Holda and Diana, accommodated the inclusion of the biblical Herodias into the pagan folk beliefs of the people. According to Italian historian Carlo Ginzburg, the geographical distribution of the ecstatic call dedicated to the hypostasis of Diana as a goddess of fairies, witches and the dead encompasses diverse regions, including Romania, that share a commonality in their Celtic heritage, with some inhabited by Celts since the 5th century BC. And the cult's presence in those regions can be attested not only by folklore and linguistic continuity, but also by archaeological findings and ecclesiastical documents. As early as the 5th century, Maximus of Turin, in a sermon against pagan cults, described a drunken peasant who was willing to mutilate himself in honor of an unnamed goddess, and he compared this peasant to a Dianaticus, or soothsayer, a term that, according to popular usage, likely denoted a state of possession or obsession brought on by religious frenzy. Gregory of Tours mentioned the worship of a Diana statue near Trier, and even in the late 7th century, as recounted in the life of St. Silianus, the people of Franconia expressed their animosity towards certain Christian missionaries by paying homage to the great Diana. However, by this time, the Roman divinity Diana had been overlaid onto one or more Celtic deities and evolved into a distinctive divine hypostasis. A significant discovery that offers insight into this was made in a grave at Rousas in France dating from the late 4th or early 5th century AD. Within this grave, a square roof tile was found, depicting a person riding a long-horned animal, accompanied by the inscription Fera Com Hera, which translates to With Cruel Hera or With Hera the Savage. Inscriptions from the same period dedicated to Hera or Herecura, a goddess believed to be of Celtic origin associated with the Roman underworld, have been unearthed in Istria, Switzerland and Cisalpine Gaul, although the spelling found at Rosia Montana in Romania is written as Erecura without the H. Even as late as the 15th century, peasants in the Palatinate maintained their belief in a divinity named Hera, who appeared in the sky during the twelve days between Christmas and Epiphany, a period associated with the return of the departed. And so, Ginsburg believes that a female figure depicted on the tile discovered in the Rusa's grave supports the long-standing hypothesis that the inclusion of Herodiana, later conflated with Herodias, among the synonyms of the nocturnal goddess was a misguided interpretation of Hera Diana. It also reinforces the interpretation of the belief in so-called deluded women who, in their devotion to the pagan Diana, rode upon certain animals following the goddess as part of her divine entourage. And so, in Romanian folklore, this cult of the nocturnal Diana and her ecstatic female following has evolved as the cult of Irodeas and her entourage of Yele, or Sanziana and her entourage of Zune, as celebrated on Midsummer. The midsummer folk traditions and beliefs in Romania have thus evolved from Diana's cults and hypostases, weaving together a captivating tapestry of archaic, pagan and Christian influences, all infused with a touch of magic and witchcraft. In this intricate tapestry, the Sanziana festivities continue to pay homage to our magical heritage and the moon with many faces that has shaped it, personified in Sanziana, Irodasa, Erecura, Diana, Bendis, and the unseen proto-Indo-European goddess behind them. Their associations with nocturnal processions, lunar ecstasies, magic, the dead, fertility, and the sacred mystery of the divine feminine are still reflected in our midsummer traditions, of which we have many that vary from place to place. But one that is consistent throughout time and space is that of reenacting the divine entourage of the goddess, central to which are wildflowers believed to be her phytomorphic substitutes. The earliest known folkloric account of this celebration can be attributed to the work of the Moldavian prince Dimitri Cantemir. Within the pages of his Descriptio Moldavie, he provided a vivid depiction of the Sanziana traditions, likening it to the worship of the goddess Ceres. He wrote, Through her, Sanziana, Dragaica, I understand Ceres, for in this time of the year, when the seeds begin to ripen, all the peasant girls from neighboring villages gather together and choose the most beautiful among them and name her Dragaica. They celebrate her in the fields with great pomp, adorning her with a woven crown made of ears of grain and many colorful ribbons, and they each hold a kiss from their granaries in their hands. Thus adorned, with outstretched hands and ribbons fluttering in the wind, 
so as to resemble a bird in flight, she turns home from the field, singing and dancing, passing through all the villages where her companions, with specific songs, call her sister and mistress as often as possible. Today, Midsummer is celebrated in most rural areas, albeit by small groups of women, as a ritual game that traditionally involves gatherings of women who dance, sing, pick wildflowers and make wreaths. These wreaths are considered a marriage of flowers and their magical forces. Some women wear them as flower crowns throughout the day, while others decorate their homes with them, but nearly all toss them over their house at the end of their festivities as a divination and protection practice. Likewise, they make wreaths for their cattle and sisters or friends, imbuing them with positive energies for protection. In the olden days, the Midsummer Day began the same for most women in villages. They would cleanse themselves in pure, untouched water, often from springs, and they would even apply dew to their faces, believing it would enhance their beauty and thus help them attract suitors. They would then venture to the fields and woods to gather wildflowers, and especially Sienna flowers, or ladies' best straw, the plant most associated with the fairies. The plant has yellow golden flowers that exude a pleasant fragrance. It can be found growing in orchards, meadows, forest edges and clearings, and it is said that they only bloom on the night of Sienna or Midsummer's Eve, which occurs between June 23rd and 24th. If they bloom earlier or later, it is believed that the harvest will suffer. According to tradition, the last day when Sunziana flowers can be picked is on June 24th, as it marks the beginning of the day's shortening. On this day, all flowers are said to emit their most potent fragrance, as if amplifying their powers before they decline. This decline is attributed to the Force Maiden, who is said to break the stems of the flowers, taking away their power and scents. And so, on this day, women would gather all sorts of flowers and refer to all yellow-colored ones as Sunziana in some regions. They would skillfully fashion wreaths for themselves and each other and place them at the gates of their houses or toss them over the building. If a wreath remained intact on the house, it was seen as a sign of good luck and long life for the person who threw it. On the other hand, if the wreath fell, it was believed to bring bad luck, illness or even death. The wreaths also contained seeds associated with a girl's future wedding, indicating whether she would have to wait long for marriage. The practice of crafting the wreaths was known as the marriage of flowers, and women believed that it enhanced the mystical properties of the plants, while also evoking the motive of the sacred marriage and the union between the sun and the moon. To me, the wreaths symbolize the intricacy of the myth and magic behind Midsummer, as opposing forces of life and death, dark and light, lunar and solar, are reconciled in a circle of flowers, and this coincidencia oppositorum is the very nature of the celebration. And so, these reeds were used in various rituals. Sick children and those affected by the forest spirits were passed through wormwood wreaths three times, as it was believed to heal and protect them from illness. Additionally, girls fashioned crowns out of wildflowers, adorning themselves with these delicate floral creations during the celebratory dance, to appear as sacred brides or fairies in the entourage of the goddess. The women also attributed divinatory and oracular functions to Sunziana and the wreaths made from them, using various practices to glimpse into their destinies and uncover their future. For example, they would place these flowers under their pillows to dream of their future husbands, wear them in their shirts throughout the day, and pin them in their hair. The belief in the flowers' magical properties extended to young girls wearing wreaths on their heads to channel their innermost beauty and thus attract love. The flowers were also recognized for their potent therapeutic properties. They were used in traditional pharmacology to treat various ailments, including liver, stomach, gallbladder, head, eye and ear pains, epilepsy, lung issues and dermatological conditions. And with midsummer considered a magical time, the flowers were carefully picked, dried and stored for medicinal purposes to preserve their healing powers. But the healing properties of plants were not limited to Sienna or ladies' bed straw. Other medicinal plants with magical and miraculous properties, such as chicory, common centauri, white clover, wild thyme, crow's onion, fern leaf, wormwood and mugwort, were also gathered by women during this time. For instance, chicory flowers collected on midsummer's morning and fashioned into a belt tied around the waist were believed to reveal through their blossoming the feelings of the betrothed or to prevent the menses of the woman wearing it that day. Completing the magical circle of fertility, healing, divination, love, union of opposites and veneration of the divine feminine, midsummer flowers are also used to honor the dead. Women place bouquets of Sienna flowers at the gates, doors or graves of their departed loved ones and ancestors, 
evoking the nocturnal and chthonic nature of the goddess and her role in guiding and protecting the dead. Those who still remember this old tradition honor their dead with a stock of sanziene and adorn the graves of children with their delicate flowers. They likewise toss their wreaths on Saturday's water or leave bouquets on the outskirts of the villages or at crossroads as offerings for the dead and the fairies. Although these traditions survive in rural settings among small groups of women, much of the magical meaning of the celebration has faded in time. The nocturnal and lunar qualities of the divine feminine presiding over midsummer have become elusive or demonized, many believing today that the festival attracts positive energies only from the triumphant sun. Indeed, for a short time, it seems as though the sun finally overpowers the moon whom he pursues so arduously. But when the sun sets on midsummer's day, the solar festivities end, and as darkness falls, most people return to their homes warding off the fairies on the way. A distinct few, however, seek them out to learn their secrets and join their ranks. Until next time, remember, you cannot see the fairies unless you step into the fairy ground.